Hi, everyone. We're going to start um, the webinar at 12 o'clock in about two minutes, and we'll be streaming this also on Facebook Live. Hi, everyone. This is Courtney Bartenswager with Central Kentucky Ag Credit. Thank you for joining us today. We're excited to have Dr. Kenny Burdom with UK here to talk about the beef outlook in Kentucky. Um, I just want to tell you that we'll ask questions at the end of his presentation. And to do that, at the bottom of your screen, there'll be three dots. You can click on that, and then there'll be a Q&A box. And feel free to type your questions there, and we'll get those over to Dr. Burdine. And we're also going to be recording this, so if you want to go back and review this or send to someone else, uh, feel free to do that. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Burdon. Thanks, Courtney. I appreciate it. And definitely want to thank all of Central Gag Credit for the invitation and opportunity to talk with you today. So thanks to them and thanks to you out there for logging on or watching, whatever the case may be. I'm looking forward to visit with you for a little bit. I'm going to plan to talk maybe 40 minutes or so and then have plenty of time for some question and answer and discussion. So, so feel free to do that. Um, here's my plan for the next little bit. I'm going to start by just kind of walking through the market quickly where things are and why things have done what they've done as of late. Um, I'm also going to spend some time talking about my expectations for the rest of the year. Particularly, I'll talk a little bit what I think we'll see from heavy feeders kind of from now to fall. And I'll also give you kind of my best guess of what our cat market might look like this fall with the, with the obvious caveat, lots is gonna drive that. Then I wanna share some things that I've kind of been sharing with producers um, over the last few months as they kind of think through how to, how to deal with these market swings. So some basic management implications. And then the last thing I'm gonna do just really quickly since it's a very timely topic is talk a little bit about the coronavirus food assistance program and the payment details that were made available to us, uh, what's that, last Tuesday, I think. So, so about about eight days ago so so with that here we go um i wanted to start off by just kind of reviewing what i would have told you had some tech ad credit asked me to do this back in january and what i would have said at the time would have been that after several years the cow herd's finally smaller so smaller cow herd in 2020 should lead to smaller calf crop in the, in the second half i've been very i was very optimistic about markets especially in terms of exports and you know was it i guess it was last fall you know we've got greater access to the japanese market usmca was going to open up some, some additional opportunity in both canada and mexico um it seems like a lot of us almost have kind of forgotten about Af um, african swine fever in china but that's a huge issue that was really dominating things up until until covid 19. and then also last fall uh china opened their opened their doors for more, more u.s poultry imports so so poultry exports from US to China. 
And all of those things to me bid pretty well in terms of cattle markets and either their direct impact in terms of trade or spillover impact, meaning the impact on markets. So that was optimistic in my opinion. And the truth is I would have said that I looked for better prices in 2020, um, especially in the second half of the year when it looked like our beef production was gonna be smaller. So I just wanna start off by saying that because in all honesty, it looked to me like fundamentally things would look better in 2020 than they did in 2019. So I was definitely more optimistic in January this year than I was in January last year. We know the rest of the story, obviously. Um, the way that I've kind of characterized the market reaction to COVID-19 has almost been in three phases. So early on, the February impact, when we first started kind of hearing a lot about it, was really mostly about what's going to be the impact on exports, in particular exports of U.S. beef into Asian markets. And then the March impact, and really about the second week of March is kind of when it started, that's when we started seeing the real impact in terms of demand. So a lot of cancellations decreased economic activity, folks not traveling, starting to see kind of our, our first major waves of layoffs. All of those things impacted consumer spending power, if you will. And at the same time, as food service outlets, as restaurants closed, we had a major shift from away from home consumption towards at home consumption. So both of those were very significant demand shifts, and that was largely the impact that we saw in March. And then when we got into this April-May time period, and really up until especially about three weeks ago, everything really shifted to supply chain disruption and what was going on with plant closures, uh, reduced operating capacity, and just how many fewer cattle we were moving through the processing system. So it almost hit in three waves. And in a lot of ways, I think the waves got more, uh, more severe as things went on. This is something else that's kind of been lost, I think, because of all the all the uh, disruption, but this has all been complicated by the fact that beef production was actually going to be pretty high in the first half of 2020. And for that matter, I can really say the same thing about pork and poultry. And we have to remember that all of these all of these meat products compete for grocery store space and consumer dollars, so they're all related. But, you know, we had pretty big production across the board in the first half of the year expected anyway, um, although the cow herd was a little bit smaller in January. We have to remember that it's really it was 20, it's 2019's calf crop that drives 2020 beef production. And I think because of the optimism on the export front, we were seeing a lot more growth in certainly port market and to lesser extent open market. So we, we had a lot of meat to work through. And at the same time, we think about processing, you know, when you're at a point like we've been where you're pretty high production levels, you know, you're going to be tapping capacity anyway. Combine that with the fact that unemployment was very low. You know, so, so labor was probably not super plentiful to begin with. It was almost the perfect storm when we started to see the supply chain disruptions that we saw, and those started about the second week of um, April. So that kind of set us up for where, we, where we've been. Um, I'm going to back up just a little bit, and I want you to focus on the left side of what I'm showing you. I want you to remember what I said about how it looked like we we're going to have quite a bit of beef production in the first half of 2020. I want you to notice how high slaughter levels were really in February and March. And I think that's something to understand. Um, it's my opinion that a lot of these processing plants anticipated some labor issues. And for that reason, we're pushing as many cattle as they could there in February and March. And again, they had to to some extent because of so many cattle being out there. The reason I wanted to show this, I, I don't talk about cold storage a great deal, but I've mentioned it a couple of times in some, some programs that I've done here in the last few weeks. But the dotted line there is cold storage by month for 2019. The red line is a previous five year average. And I want you to notice that typically what we see is cold storage is high in January. And as we move into spring, so think about, you know, roughly where we are now, we start to pull that down. And the reason I wanted to mention this is because if you look what happened from January to February and into March, we were actually seeing an increase in cold storage. And I think it goes back to these really high processing levels February and March. So I think that's noteworthy that we we did some things, I think, to try to at least build up some, some supply in the system in the short run. And although we drew that down some from March to April, it is worth noting that that's much higher than um, what we saw in 19 or five-year average. Some roughing economists back of the napkin math, 
that is probably about nine days worth of consumption in the U.S. So it's not it's not a huge buffer, but it's significant the fact that it's there. Then we know what happened from there. So if you look at the very kind of bottom here, this blue line. So blue line is cattle slaughter for 2020. Uh, dotted line is 2019. A lot of folks who do what I do like to talk about current year compared to previous year to kind of put things in perspective. So if you look at that very bottom, okay, the, the lowest slaughter levels that we saw, that was about 35% below 2019 levels. Okay? And that's associated obviously with, with very high box feed prices and, and relatively low mid cattle price. I want you to notice though, the last three and four weeks, we really have ramped up slaughter quite a bit. So again, if, if the bottom was 35% below 2019 levels, where we were last week is estimated to be about 15% below 2019 levels. So we really have done a lot in terms of pushing cattle through the system. Given box beef price, packers, I think, have incentive to do that. But I think that's very, very important. And we, we've seen an impact on, on the marketplace. Now, we're probably not going to get back to 2019 levels right away. A lot of these plants have had to slow down speed. A lot of these plants have also had to like put in additional protocols. They've had to space workers out. You may have seen some videos where some folks have possibly put in, um, you know, glass dividers or something. We've had a lot of that going on. They've slowed things down some, but the fact that we've moved up so much from where we were just about four weeks ago, I think is very significant. And we've seen slaughter cattle price move up because of that. You look at where slaughter cattle price was, we had dipped down somewhere there around 96, 97 cents a pound. And for this past week, we're going to average, we, we did average somewhere in kind of that 117 to 118. So very significant change in fed cattle price. And frankly, if you look at where we are this year, again, that blue line compared to that dotted line, we actually are just a little bit above where prices were this time last year. I think that's significant that we, we have seen some improvement, I think, largely because they managed to push more cattle through the system. Now, moving back closer to home, let's talk about Kentucky prices. We'll talk about these kind of in tandem one by one. I'm going to start with heavy feeders, and I always use an 850 pound steer as kind of my baseline. So that light blue line, that's an 850 pound medium to large frame number one two steer. What I grab for this series is I grab, I grab that report from the state average every Friday, and I grab the one that does not have a descriptor. So if you see something next to it that says value added or fancy or thin or fleshy or something, I, I don't grab those. I grab the non-descript ones, okay? So I kind of grab a basic market average. So the price that I'm showing you will understate what higher quality value added larger groups sell for, but it, it's a baseline is what it is. That steer was selling for about 130, 138 or so back in January. This past week, he pushed up to about 124. I want you to notice where he was back about the middle part of March. Now, here's another way to show you the same thing. I typically like to look at monthly prices more so than weekly prices. Um, I've been watching weekly more so the last couple of months because things move so quickly. But that blue line there is 2020 prices for 850 pound steer. He dropped eight or nine dollars a hundred weight for three straight months, basically from January to April, okay? and then finally bounced back some in May. I want you to look at the black line for a second, though, because that's kind of the seasonal pattern for these eight weight steers. What we tend to see is they make their highest point, their highest price point, sometime late summer, early fall. So I usually think about August or September as being their seasonal high. They usually move up from from winter from the you know from January February straight through summer. Okay, so what COVID did is it took out that run up. So we're we're quite far behind right now on them. Um, again, last week state average average is about 124. To put it in perspective, though, um, there were some higher quality larger groups that I sold that I think sold for right about a dollar thirty or so that I saw in the market before. So that kind of gives you a range. There's usually somewhere in the ballpark. Of six to twelve dollars a hundred weight difference in kind of that state average price and what the upper end group sell for. Now let's talk about calves. Um, so calves started the year around 144, 145 per hundred weight. And 
ended last week at about the same price. And I think when you think about calves, much like heavy feeders, you've got to think about what could have been. Um, with so many of these things, it's not enough to just look at how does the current price compare to January or February. You've really got to think about, okay, what would this price be had we not been dealing with COVID? So back in January, I had a fall feeder cattle futures price up in the 140s. And at one time, I think it was in middle of March, that price had gotten down to something like, you know, mid 120s. Okay, so at that point, the real, the real market impact was not how much of calves fallen. It's how much more would these calves be selling for if I still had a, a, a fall feeder cattle futures price somewhere up in the mid to upper 140s. So again, black line, there's kind of a longer run average, but calf prices typically make their peak sometime in March or April. Okay? And what COVID did is it really took out what we usually see in terms of a spring price improvement for calves. So it really took out our, our seasonal improvement. So we've seen really a flat calf market when it should have been a calf market that would have gotten better with the first of the year. Um, quantifying this stuff is always tough, but so, some back of the napkin stuff that I did a few weeks ago, and things are a bit better now, admittedly, especially on, for heavier feeders. But when I really factor in not just how much the markets have dropped, but where I thought they would be otherwise, I would have called our heavy feeders off somewhere between $150 and $225 a head, kind of from, from where they look like they would have been had we been asking this question back in January versus where they actually were about the middle of March. Okay. So we, we've definitely gained some of that back, but the impact of the worst was somewhere in that 150 to 25 range, in my opinion. It varies, of course, based on you know, size of the cattle, quality of the cattle, lot size, and so forth, but something in the 150 to 225 range per head. Calves may be a little bit harder to call, but I really go back to that question. You know, what would these calves that were selling for $1.40, 45 you know, sell for if had a spring board up in the mid to upper 140s? And I think the answer is probably somewhere in the dollar sixties. So I actually think that our calves were off somewhere between 100 and 150 ahead of you know, what they actually weighed. So that's the way I've kind of viewed the impact on the market, especially at, at its worst point a few weeks ago. I also want to briefly share something on the cold cow market. Um, I think sometimes we forget how significant cold cow markets are for our cow calf operators. But again, I'm showing you weekly price for cold cows. And, and, and what I've chosen to use here is my baseline. This is an 80 to 85 percent boning cow, and I use the average dress. So there will always be cows sell above this, always be cows sell below this. I want you to go back and look at kind of where we were in the beginning of COVID 19. Okay, that, that cow was somewhere kind of here in the low 150s. She really ran up big time. And, and what I'm pointing to right now, that, that is the last week of March, all right? You can make an argument that cull cow markets that are largely ground beef driven should actually benefit in times like this when consumers have to make a major shift from restaurant consumption towards at home consumption. And frankly, when incomes are a bit strapped. So when there's kind of that negative demand shot shock because ground beef is consumed more at home and it also tends to be cheaper. I think we saw a lot of that. Now, we saw a very sharp drop from two straight weeks, okay, that took us down here to the second week of April. So we took off about 17, 18 bucks, 100 weight off of these cold cow prices over two weeks there quickly. And this, in my opinion, was mostly just due to the initial impact of some of those plant closures, shutdowns, and slowdowns. So that really hit our cold cow market very hard. We steadily built it back. And last week, um, that, that same cold cow, that 80, 85% boning cow, average dress, she broke through 60 cents a pound. And that was obviously the second highest price that we'd seen this year. But I wanted to go back and see exactly how long it had been since we'd had this particular cold cow series above 60 cents a pound prior to this last week in March, and I had to go back actually to 2017. So I just wanted to make the point that it has been a pretty good cull cow market, historically speaking. Now I'm showing you the same cull cow price series. Now I'm showing you monthly again, blue lines current year, red lines last year, other line is that 10 year average. We are below 
that 10 year average, but understand that that average was pulled up very much by coal cow prices in 2014 and 15. Hey, we, we are still significantly above where we were last year. And again, to go back to where we are last, to where we were last week, I had one observation this year, last week in March, and I had to go back to 2017 to find another one where these 85% boning cows were above 60 cents a pound. So <clears throat> it has been a pretty good call cow market and be aware of that if you're yeah, I'm looking at your option. You, know, you do have an outlet for fall cows if you're a fall calver or spring calver this fall. And for most cow calf operators, cold cows account for something in the ballpark of 20 to 25 percent of your revenue. So, next question that I think is worth asking is how has COVID 19 affected the fundamentals? And I maintain what I said earlier that I really came into 2020 fairly optimistic because I thought we'd finally turn the corner on the cattle cycle. We're gonna start seeing smaller cattle crops. And I was very encouraged about exports coming into 2020. Understand first off that the demand impact is, is, is multifaceted. It's hard to just pinpoint one particular thing. So there is a wealth effect that comes into play from layoffs, from uncertainty, um, the decreased activity, and this can mean a lot of things but you know less travel less events there's, there's been a lot of stories about how significant certain meat products are at things like sporting events or you know major major attractions of some type you know th there's an impact there and then it's really difficult also to quantify this shift from food service to at home because you think about it the types of products that are sold through the two markets are not the same quantities the way that they're packaged and they're processed so that also created an issue um, as we think beyond the initial demand impact and think about this processing model, again, and that really is important to understand is that we've really had two things going on. Well, we've had a demand shock and then a processing bottleneck as, as meat packers have had to either slow down or some even shut down for a period of time. But the good news is the bottleneck is improving, although it's going to probably gradually improve from here on. We saw a lot of ramp up the last few weeks. You have to think we're probably getting pretty close to be able to operate for a while. But again, the fact that box beef prices are so high, I think certainly does give packers incentive to push cattle through as they can. And I think as they get more efficient operating in the new system, they, they will do that. Um, one of the reasons I was optimistic about the second half of 2020 in terms of cattle prices was because was because beef production was going to be lower in the second half of the year. Um, in reality, though, because of this bottleneck, we, we are pushing production into the second half of the year. So with slaughter being down so much there for several weeks, and then you can also go back and look at cattle on feed numbers, placements, and even here locally, look at how many cattle move through our auction markets. There's no question that we are backing cattle up in the system. So we do have a bit of a backlog of cattle. And, and that's just simply going to push more beef in the second half of the year. So I do think this weighs on the market in the second half of the year and impacts our fall markets too. The thing that I think is going to have the biggest impact, frankly, the biggest driver as to how long this lasts and how long it takes is first of all, how quickly we can move things to the system, but also what happens as more and more things reopen. You know, um, Different states are taking different approaches, um, you know, but you know we're, we're starting to see you know more people travel, restaurants reopening, you know more states are allowing more things to start to happen, and I'm, I'm convinced that a lot of other states are going to be watching those states and then seeing how things progress. And I think that may be the biggest single factor that drives um, how quickly things return to a pseudo normal. Now, in terms of what I look for for the rest of 2020. Um, I'll walk you through some expectations and I'll also kind of talk to you, about, I'll share with you some things that I've been telling people as they've either called or, or emailed or reached out to me on Twitter or something like that. But I do think that in terms of what we saw this spring, that our winter backgrounders were probably hit the hardest. Just simply because so many of those had cattle that they had carried through the winter, they were trying to sell this spring and had, had less flexibility on marketing. With summer stockers, I think it really is kind of all about placement time. Um, in reality, this spring market did give summer stock operators some opportunity to place some calves at a relatively attractive price. 
and lay them into a decent return situation. So I, I think there's some potential there for some folks that did buy cash, particularly in April, you know, to have gotten a good buy on some cash that they'll sell this fall and probably do reasonably well on. Um, one of the questions that I got, and, and it's probably a bit a bit past this now for many, but the general concept of, I think applies. I had a lot of folks who had wintered cattle and were planning to sell this spring and, and saw the market drop and want to know what their options were. And you know they were thinking about different things. And something that I typically do tell people almost in any situation is you know be be really careful about deviating from your typical marketing plan just in response to something unexpected in the marketplace because it's very much out of our control. And very seldom do I think people make really good decisions when they make them quickly and out of fear. Um, so a lot of people ask about, well, could I delay simply selling these cattle? And the answer is yes. And, and in reality, if you could do that for, right, you know, for a good amount of time, that may have been the right thing to do. But my general advice is still the same. You know, you only want to do that if the cattle are gaining efficiently. You know, if they're gaining efficiently. You know, you, you don't want to keep cattle longer than you intended to and then sell fleshy heavy feed or take a major price discount. You know, you also don't want to push them beyond the weights that are attractive for feed yards. And again, you know, one of my biggest concerns about the second half of 2020 is how it's clear to me that we're backing a lot of cattle up in the system. Um, another extreme, I had a lot of my winter backgrounders that asked me, well, should I think about retaining ownership on cattle that I was planning to sell this spring? I've got nothing against retaining ownership at all. You know, a lot of people do a very good job with that. But um, I don't think it's a good idea to retain ownership on cattle if you're just simply doing it to avoid taking a loss on the cattle that you're selling. Because you really don't avoid that loss. Those cattle are worth what they're worth. What you actually do is you take the loss on those heavy feeders and then you roll that into a finishing program. Okay, so in a lot of ways, what you're really doing, if that's your motivation, is you're speculating on the fed cattle market. So again, if, if retain ownership is part of your typical program, absolutely. If, if you've got good cattle that do well, then yeah, that, that may make perfect sense. But don't retain ownership for the first time simply because you don't like what the market is offering for heavy feeder cattle. Um, thinking about stalkers for a little bit. So, so now I'm going to kind of shift gears and talk about stalkers. Um, I put this together yesterday, but this still holds the, the fall board October November was somewhere kind of in the 135 to 137 range. So that should give us an expected price for 150 pound steer come fall. And I'm going to use 126, but somewhere in the mid 120s. So with that kind of in the back of my mind, I look about it, I look at the 200 day grass program, pound and a half per day of gain on grass. That's, you know, they'll do much better than that in the spring, the sloth in the summer. So I'm, I'm assuming a dollar. And a half throughout the <coughs> sorry full time period. Sorry. Very simple cost um, thirty five dollars in pasture maintenance. I'm going to plug in forty dollars for pasture rent. I'm going to figure you know three quarters of an acre per head on stalker operation. Quarter pound a day of mineral, twenty bucks a bag or forty cents a pound, and then figure two percent death loss and five percent interest. When I run something like that through a basic stalker budget, I use that, that placing that stalker of about $1.45, which is about state average now. I probably couldn't put a group of calves together for that right now, but I certainly could have in April. And I'm projecting a decent return to a stalker enterprise, you know, for, for calves placed back in the spring. So, you know, when you walk through something like this and think about the stalker perspective, you know, depending on what I had to pay for those calves that I placed in the spring, and then what the board is offering me for fall delivery. And if my costs are reasonably close, well, that's not an unattractive return to land capital management for a lot of operators. And understand in that I've got built in some pasture rent, which may or may not be a cash cost. I do have interest built in there at 5%. And five is nice to use because I can very easily do change off of a flat 5%. Um, and I've got 2% death loss built. So, you know, this, this is not an unattractive return for most summer stocker operators. Um, anytime you're in a margin environment, and this is true of summer stockers, this is true of winter backgrounders, anybody who operates in an environment where they're, where they're buying calves and selling feeders on a different market, 
know the sensitivities. Um, if my expected sale weighs 150 pounds and my expected profit's about $85, I automatically know that a 10% price drop, meaning if that $1.26 I expect becomes a $1.16, I've gone from an $86 return to roughly a break even. So know, know how sensitive your return is to your sale price. You know, what I pay for calves in a stocker operation makes a huge difference in, in terms of returns. Um, and every nickel that I can that I can save buying those calves, or every nickel more that I spend, impacts that bottom line by 27 to 50 if I'm buying 550 pound steer calves. So just know that. Folks who spend a lot of time, you know, grabbing calves at better buys, you know, that's what they're chasing. They're they're chasing margin by getting better deals on calves. 1% change in death loss is going to shave eight or nine dollars off of that bottom line. I usually assume 2%, but you know, that there are folks that will buy higher risk calves, they'll get them bought cheaper, and then they just know the death loss. Will be. And death loss will be higher, and so will health costs. You know, there's there's lots of ways that people do that and make make money running cattle and margin operations. Um, interest rates, I, I told you I use 5% because it's nice and easy. It's it's very easy to it's very easy to work from 5% and talk about a five or ten percent change. But you know, a one percent change in interest rate—if if your rate was one percent, or I'm sorry, if your rate was four percent instead of five percent—then I'm going to add someone in the ballpark of three to five dollars on the bottom line for that. So, a lot of discussion about interest rates, and they are attractive right now. But, but typically, a fairly small impact on on a stocker operation. You know, if if I were doing this in March before placement of calves. I would have talked about how good margin operators are opportunistic, meaning that you know when they you know the, they know what they know what the market is offering them in the fall, they run break even purchase prices, and when they see a good weight on a group of calves, they they jerk. so when they see a good price group of calves, they jump on very quickly. They may not always buy the same type of cattle, the same weight of cattle. They look for the best buys and they're flexible, so they're opportunistic. The same thing also applies to pricing and. One of the things that volatility does, although volatility is a bad word in, in a lot of our circles, but one thing volatility does is it sometimes leads to opportunity, right? And in the same way that we talked about how volatility provides an opportunity for some of these summer stock operators to place some calves in April at a pretty good price, the same is also going to be true. About two days run together on folks, probably two, two and a half weeks ago, that, that fall board was actually above 140 and it moved back down to about 130. It's about 136, 137 now. So we've had opportunities to price cattle even higher than we can right now. So in the same way that margin operators are opportunistic about the kind of calves that they place, we can also be opportunistic about um, how we go about pricing and, and when we jump on pricing calves. And you know, I, I think it's very possible that that fall board does get back up there at some point, in which case I would really be thinking about pricing some of these calves that I might have bought back in the spring. Because I think it's a pretty good opportunity if, if we see that again. Um, in terms of our calf markets, um, always harder to predict that far out, but I'm convinced that this still impacts our markets this fall. And it's mostly due to, I think, lingering demand effects and the fact that the, that the uh, you know, there, there, there will still be a lot of people that will have less secure employment and there's still going to be a lot of these cattle work in this system that will kind of backlog. So what I had projected first of the year, I had said that our fall calf market would be 10 to 15 cents higher per pound than it was in 2019. When I make my estimates right now, I think this cat market will be much will be very similar to what we saw in 2019. So to kind of put it in perspective, um, a 550 pound steer last fall was traded somewhere kind of in that 130 to 135 range. And I honestly think when we take the grass out and we start thinking about this fall, that he'll be back there again. So in other words, I think these calves may sell for comparable prices to what they sold for last year come fall. But I think they're going to be seventy to eighty dollars lower than I would have expected back in January. So again, we may not see a huge difference in nineteen and twenty, but I think we're going to see a pretty big difference in what they would have been otherwise. So I, I definitely think this this impacts the market for calves this fall. 
I would say the same thing to cal calf operators that I would have said to winter backgrounders. You know, be careful about delaying uh, or changing your marketing plans drastically. A lot of fall calvers chose to keep cow calves on the cow or chose to you know to to run some calves on grass for a while after weaning, and I thought that made perfect sense. But the truth of the matter is, I might have advocated that in any year, you know, whether or not we had COVID nineteen, because you're putting gain on very very inexpensive. In general, I don't usually think of, I don't usually advocate um, feeding programs in the spring of the year, just because what happens is you know you've got stocker operators with very low cost to gain to kind of bid the price of our calves up, and if you're feeding calves at the same time, you're effectively competing. With them. So unless you've got very low cost of gain on a feeding program, I generally don't advocate those much in the spring because I don't think you can win when you're competing against stock operators who are adding weight on grass. Um, we will see, I think, the fall calf market impacted on spring calvers. And anytime something like this happens for cow calf operators, I always say, you know, you, you've got to think long term. And sometimes markets like this one, and like what we saw last year, are times when we can get good good buys on breeding stock. And, and I mentioned cold cow market being strong. You know, it may make sense for some folks to cull a bit harder, buy some good young bred heifers, or develop some heifers themselves and think about, okay, I, I want to get my Howard younger. So I've got more younger cows with more longevity for better days that should lay ahead for calf, calf operators. Um, last point that I'll make though is, you know, we're, you want to expect a bumpy ride. And, and I definitely mean that, you know, we've seen volatility already. I feel like we've seen the worst of it. Um, having to work through the initial demand shocks and then the supply chain disruption of the last couple of months, but we're still going to see a lot of volatility. And, you know, I mentioned about what, you know, may or may not happen when things open back up, you know, we could have some supply chain disruption again, if plants have to shut down, there's going to be some things we just simply don't anticipate because it's very, this is something that's very new to these markets. So just expect some volatility, you know, kind of think logically about it. And use it if you're a margin operator, use volatility to your advantage sometime and take advantage of opportunities as they present themselves. Um, last thing I'm gonna talk about, and then I'll hand it back over and we'll take questions for a while. I want to take a minute and talk a little bit about um, the, the direct payments that were announced last week through the coronavirus food assistance program. So sign up actually begin yesterday with your local FSA office. You've got several forms that have to be on file. For most of you that have a relationship already with FSA, they're probably already on file, but it's, you know, it's your basic contact info farm type. Um, there's stuff, I think there's five or six of those, and most are probably on file already. There is a separate CFAP application that you will fill out that can be done. You can mail it, you can fax it, you can do it online. But there's lots of ways to do that. That's what you'll actually be filling out to actually apply for the direct payments. The easiest way to think about um, these direct payments, in my opinion, is to think about them as two separate payments and two separate payment rates, but you'll apply simultaneously and you'll be paid simultaneously for them. So they, they will only be two separate payments in the sense that as you fill the application, they'll ask you different questions. It, it'll look like it's seamless when you do it. Um, the, the first payment is what they call the CARES payment. And that's made on a per head basis for actual sales of cattle from January 15 to April 15. January 15, April 15, and based on actual cattle sales. The second payment and a much smaller payment rate is the CCC rate. Okay? And that's on any unpriced cattle in inventory from April 16 to May 14. So what USDA effectively did is they drew a line on the scene. And they drew that line at April 15th, right? So if you did not sell cattle prior to April 15th, then those cattle are going to fall in the lower CCC rate that's based on inventory. If you sold them between Jan 15 and April 15th in that 90 day window, then they will qualify for the larger CARES rate. I'm kind of showing you those now. So the CARES rate published per head for fed cattle, which won't apply to a lot of Kentuckians, but the fed cattle was 214 ahead. For mature slaughter cattle, so think about slaughter cows, think about cull cows and cull bulls, for example, $92 a head. For feeder cattle, think calves, under 600 pounds, $102 a head. 
for feeder cattle over 600 pounds, think 139, it's 139 ahead. And then all other category, I interpret that to be other breeding stock, you know, mature, mature cows, stock cows, red heifer. That's kind of my interpretation of that 102. Okay, so that's the CARES rate. As I mentioned, the, the CCC rate's much lower. So, you know, if I had heavy feeder cattle that I, that I sold in early April, then I would get, you know, this higher CARES rate for them. If I kept them towards the end of April, and I'm past the April 15 deadline, I'm going to get the lower CCC rate. So it's really been that April 15 deadline that I think has caused the most heartburn and brought about the most questions from producers. But this is the structure of the payments that were put in place. Um, two more things to be aware of. Number one, USDA has said that initially we're going to make 80% of that payment. So what I just showed you, this is the full payment rate. Okay, so when you sign up, you will actually get your initial, your initial payment will be 80% of those rates. And I think they're doing that to ensure that they have sufficient funds. They don't want to run out of funding for this and they have some other programs. So you get 80% up front. And then after sign up is over, assuming there's still plenty of funds left, then you'll get the remaining 20% or whatever portion that's actually left. So be aware the initial payment will be 80% of that total. They've done a really good job of keeping info on this website, www.farmers.gov backslash, I guess it's forward slash CFAP, CFAP. Um, the specific details are on there and a whole lot more detail that I can give you in a couple minutes here. Frequently asked questions, there's actually even, um, there's actually even some links to the webinars and things like that. You can see the final rule if you want to and kind of learn more about it. Um, but, but use that website you have additional questions about CFAP, it's out there. So definitely if you qualify, take advantage of it. Um, someone asked at one point, are additional, are additional rounds of funding possible? Certainly they are, there's no way to know that, but it's very possible there will be another round of payments that might, might cover sales after April 15th. We just simply don't know yet. So this refers to the initial funding that was part of the CARES Act that I'm referring to now. Timing worked out almost perfect. It's 12.40, so we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, I'm going to leave this slide for just a second, but reach out to me anytime. Um, I am largely working from home. I'm in the office a little bit, but reach out to me anytime by phone, by email. If you're on Twitter, you can follow me at KY Cattle Econ. I've been posting some, you know, market update kind of stuff, you know, two to three times a week, videos, whatnot. So reach out anytime. I'm always glad to hear from you. Um, and I'm going to hand it back over so we can start doing some questions. Thank you, Dr. Burdine. Again, if you have a question, uh, at the bottom of your screen, there'll be three dots. You click on that button, and there'll be a Q&A button, and you can type your question in there. Also, if you're joining us Facebook Live, you can comment your question, and we'll uh, get those asked as well. Um, so our first question is, we are so heavily, heavily cons consolidated at the packer level, there has been a good deal of talk about new startups. Do you think this will have any traction? It may have some. Um, the thing I think that we have to remember, though, is that, you know, for a, a new startup processing plant to move into the, move into the business, they they have to perceive that there's additional capacity needs for a long period of time. So I think it's more likely that we see that the longer that this goes on. Um, with the cow herd shrinking, and I think we do, you know, we will see some reduction of beef production second half of the year. That may slow them to some extent, but, but all indications are that right now there's attractive margins in the business, right? It's just a question of how long it's perceived to actually last. Would I add this too, if you don't mind, Courtney, I almost forgot. You know, we've, so that's kind of bigger picture, um, large scale stuff. You know, we've been short of local processing capacity, in my opinion, for a while. And I do think that we're very likely to see um, some additional capacity for um, smaller custom operation, you know, custom type processing facilities here in the state. I, I think there's definitely demand for that and has been even pre COVID 19. So that may have also been the question too, and I apologize. Another question is, certain Wendy's locations still have no ground beef. Area groceries now are selling ground beef for $7 a pound. How long do you see this lasting for consumers? Well, it's, it's slowly getting better. Um, we may not be seeing it just yet at 
food service level. But box beef price has been dropping now for about two weeks. It's still really high, still really high. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're seeing cull cow prices move up as we're trying to move more ground beef into the system. So there's also sometimes a delay between processing and actually when we see the impact and we just apply at the local level. So I think it's going to get better over time, but I, I do think we're still going to see the issue persist for probably a few months still. Okay, another question we've got is, what is your outlook on cow-calf prices and bred heifers? Um, make sure I was in the question. So the question is about what 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 is my expectation for um, bread heifer prices maybe this fall? Is that the question? I think so, yes. Okay. Yeah, so bread heifer prices tend to follow the calf market. So if you look at kind of what they have done, and, and part of the difficulty here is we don't have near as good a price series on bread heifer. So what I tend to look at is I tend to look at what bread heifer sell for and bread heifer sales and you always have some that do better than that, some that do worse. But those bred heifers last year averaged, depending on the location, uh, for fall now. So for, for a spring calving heifer that sold in the fall, um, they averaged around 16 to 16.50, something like that. And I would honestly guess she's in about that same ballpark again this fall. And then if the question was more about spring and a fall calver, um, you can usually add on about $150, $200 to for springer calf price in the fall to get a fall, fall calf in the spring. So fall calving heifers that are sold in the spring tend to sell for about $150 more than spring calving heifers sold in the fall. Al Gwynn has raised his hand, so we'll um, unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question. Sounds good. Okay, you okay. can go ahead. Profit between what the slaughterhouse is making and what it has been making in the past as it relates to what the farmer is actually getting in regard to the margin of profit? So I, I think I missed the first part of your question. I, I heard the second part, though, and you're asking about the difference in the profit. profitability. Yes. That's the level versus. Yes. So, the question, the question is really, is really not, you may want to cut your mic off. Yeah, there we go. Um, I think the question ultimately is about the divergence between box beef price and live cattle price. So, the fact that they diverged some, honestly, was not surprising. I think where the question comes in is how much they diverged, right? So the processing bottleneck itself, where was especially a few weeks ago when we had like literally 35% fewer cattle moving to the system, we had less beef coming out. At the same time, we had this consumer buying behavior where they were kind of stocking up on things. So they were not super price sensitive to the grocery store. And at the same time, we had this backlog of cattle building up. So what we saw was boxed beef price run up and fed cattle price go down. Um, so the fact that that happened, unfortunately, is, is part of what happens when you get into processing the bottleneck. Now, your question is about compared to historical levels, and there's no question if I just simply look at box beef price and estimate what the average slaughter animal is selling for, and then the same sort of thing with the average fed animal selling for, then there is a big divergence. Now, to be fair, what we don't know is we don't know how those costs have changed. We don't know, you know, how um, we don't know how many we're running through and things like that. But there's no question that it's there. You also can't deny the fact that you know the, the major four packers do have an age in the market. And I won't lie to you about that. That's, you know, that there is actually market power that comes with that. You're aware there's an investigation that is probably going to be starting very soon or already has that's going to look at, you know, packer margins and particularly look at the possibility of price manipulation. I don't do that kind of work myself, but I'd be very interested to see what, what they come up with for sure. We have another question from John Sparks with cattle on feed placements being so low. How do you think that will affect the basis of yearlings this fall? That's a good question. Yeah. 
So, yeah, so to John's question, and, and I won't get the numbers exactly right, but if you look at, if you look at cattle on feed numbers that came out in April and then in May, uh, placements were down over 20% both months. So basically that means we've got a lot of cattle they're gonna have to work through. And when you, when you see that happen, what you, what you tend to see is you tend to see basis wide. So to answer John's question directly, when I ran my quick stocker budget, looking at fall prices, I ran an 850, $10 back of the board, uh, which is a little bit wider than usual for groups. I usually figure on something like four to six bucks off for 800 pound steer and then maybe $2 more for 50 pounds. So I went a little bit weaker, but, but I think your general question is, is spot on that we're probably gonna see basis a little bit weaker because some of those cattle gotta work with the system that's really probably starting this summer and going into fall. We're also seeing weights move up too, by the way, at the backer level. Okay. And, and if I can stop you just a second too, there was one question that came through that I actually just saw in the chat and I apologize to Elizabeth for not seeing it. Um, it says, with no land costs and no interest, is it correct that building up quality of heifers and herd size for first half of 2020? Um, I think you're asking. Um, so coming into 20, okay, I think I understand the question. So coming into 2020, the cow herd was a little over 1% smaller than 2019. Um, given what we've seen thus far in 2020, I think that'll continue. So I think the cow herd was smaller coming into this year. Um, I think our Kentucky herd actually is, is even smaller than I think even USDA projected. Um, and then I actually think that we'll see that continued into 2021. So I think this cow herd is smaller again when the numbers come out next year, would be my guess. Sorry, Courtney, go ahead. I was just going to add, if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to type them in the chat. So again, it's the three little dots, and then you click on that, and it'll be Q&A, or you can raise your hand, and we can um, unmute you. Okay, we do have another question. Uh, do you have any trended information on input costs that follow your line charts from 2010 through 2018, 2019, and 2020? Seems like the dollar per hundred weight have been declining over the past two years. Producers are facing higher input costs, effectively reducing net income. Yeah, that's a good question, Beth. And unfortunately, I'm sorry I don't have it handy to show you. We run cost numbers you know, pretty much on a monthly basis for folks. So I, I have a decent feel for it. Um, some of your cost, some, some of your costs have not gone up with prices, but a lot of them have, we know that. Certainly things related to machinery, fencing, certainly land, those kind of things have gone up. And, and that's a good chunk of our cow-calf cost. Where we haven't necessarily seen the same thing is on things like fertilizer and then to some extent, but for most cow calf operators, you know, feed costs is more function of hay and fertilizer than, than purchase feed. So, where I think we're really seeing the costs go up are on land, labor, fencing, machinery, and those types of items. That's all the questions we're seeing. Again, um, I think we have a few more minutes. If you'd like to ask one, feel free to do that at this time. We're not seeing any come through. I uh, want to thank you again, Dr. Burdon, for taking the time to put this together and provide this to uh, not only Central Kentucky Ag Credit's customers, but um, anyone that's interested. And in. again, this will be recorded, um, so we'll share that. And it is on our Facebook page. We've uh, shared it as a live stream, so you're able to go back and watch it there. Well, thank you guys for, for having me ask me to do this. I, I enjoyed spending a little time with you here at lunch today. And I certainly wish everybody the best. I always tell people I wish them good weather and good prices, but I guess I should probably say good weather and better prices in 2020. So uh, that'd probably be fair as far as I can go. So thanks a bunch. All right. Thank you.